Well, welcome to the 700 Club. My father, Pat Robertson, the founder of the Christian Broadcasting Network, Operation Blessing, Regent University, American Center for Law and Justice. He passed away this morning at 4.49 a.m. My sister Anne and her husband Gary were with him at the bedside. The family's been gathering all this week. My other sister Elizabeth flew in from Dallas. My children were there. His children, his grandchildren have all been around him this week and listening to him. He wanted to give us final blessings. He wanted to tell us how much he loved us. Yesterday, his granddaughters, Abby and Laura, were reading Psalms over him, and it reminded me of what his Aunt Josephine did when he was still a baby, that he, she would read Psalms over him in his crib, and he remembered that lasted for years, and those Psalms got deep within his soul. So it was such a tribute to him for God to inspire his granddaughters to come and say that same thing and do that same thing that his aunt did so many years ago over his crib. He left my sisters and granddaughters with a message that I want to share for you. And I think it's for everyone who is part of the CBN family, all the viewers, all the, the ones that he wanted to love and he wanted to preach the gospel to. Here it is. I tried to listen to the Lord. I loved you all. I walked with the Lord. I hope I've passed that on to you. And my hope is, yes, you would receive that. You would have your own walk with the Lord. You would listen to his voice. You would let him guide you. Because I can assure you, when you listen to the voice of the Lord and you obey it, you will have a very wonderful life. Well, Gordon, I know I speak on behalf of all of us who are family, see me on family. And <laughs> I mean, we feel your loss. We feel Pat's loss, but what a day in heaven. Can you just imagine? I mean, I feel like I want to play that song right now. <laughs> I can only imagine because I know it was glorious. But yeah, my thank father, you. my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. that was spoken over him last yeah, night. His was... steadfastness was just remarkable. And speaking of that, 62 of Pat's 93 years he spent hosting live television. I'm sure that's a record. October 1st, 1961, at 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, Pat made his first appearance ever on television. And from that initial broadcast in Portsmouth, Virginia, the gospel has gone to the uttermost parts of the earth. Here is a look at Pat Robertson's life and amazing legacy. CBN. The Christian broadcaster Pat Robertson launched his first television station in 1961. It was a time of growing prosperity in America, an era of hopes and dreams, and conquering new frontiers. The young Christian broadcaster also had big dreams to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. At that time, it seemed an impossible dream. The signal from his small TV station barely reached around the block. And a word from God to claim a television station for his glory. That seemed impossible in those days. Pat's confidence was in the Lord, and he wasn't disappointed. Over the years, CBN grew into the worldwide ministry he had envisioned in those early days, a ministry that has been used of God to change lives and answer prayer. Risen from the ashes, tremendous testimony. We're going to have an exclusive with that today. I'm sure if Pat were here today, he would give a testimony as to what God did here at CBN. He wouldn't take credit for it. He, he would say it was God. And uh, it is God, but God uses men. God used Pat. He walked the baby boomers home. He was a very, very good friend. He followed God fully. All of his life, Marion Gordon Robertson was affectionately called Pat. The nickname stuck when his older brother Willis often touched his cheek and mimicked the instruction, Pat, Pat, Pat. He was part of what history has labeled the silent generation. Martin Luther King, Robert and Ted Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, and Elvis. Jesse Jackson and Chuck Holson were all born in the silent generation. While their voices were anything but silent, this generation never had one of their own elected to the U.S. presidency. 
though several ran, including Pat Robertson in 1988. Thank you. God bless you. I entered the race as a champion of conservative values. I entered the race so I might speak out on great moral issues confronting our nation, and I entered the race to win. I did not win. When you think of Pat Robertson, I think the, one of the major lessons you learn that if, if you have a dream, go after it, even if you fall short of it, to go after the presidency against all odds. For the first time, the world had to take the church seriously in a way that heretofore they had relegated us over to stained glass window the padded pews and said, stay in your little corner and go no further. He shattered the stained glass window. He shattered the glass ceiling and engaged the process. And from that point on, I believe that people of faith were taken seriously beyond the church house into the White House. His political influence grew enormously after his run for the presidency through this fortuitous encounter with uh, Ralph Reed and the formation of the Christian Coalition. During the next decade, the Christian Coalition grew to become one of the most powerful lobby groups in the country. Perhaps their biggest accomplishment was the successful appointment of a conservative majority on the U.S. Supreme Court. Whether it be into politics or world events, uh, he was always uh, had his fingers into these various areas and, and as to what God was doing and how Christians should be praying and how Christians could get involved, I, I loved it. Pat Robertson grew up in the shadow of the Blue Ridge Mountains in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley. Raised in Lexington, Virginia, he was the second son of U.S. Senator A. Willis Robertson and Gladys Churchill Robertson. A mix of ministers, lawyers, and politicians marked the Robertson ancestry, including two U.S. presidents and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. James Robertson, an Anglican priest, landed in Virginia in 1695. Pat's father served 34 years in the United States Congress. His mother, a gracious Southern lady, was an asset to her husband's long political career. And I used to laugh that I first learned mommy, then I learned daddy, then I learned constituent. <laughs> we were always conscious of what, what the public would think, and that, that was a good thing. Pat's spiritual formation began at home in Lexington, where he had the benefit of a loving home and a rock-solid community. With his family, he attended the Manly Memorial Baptist Church. During his teen years, Pat remembers church as more of a social outlet. It was at the onset of the Second World War that his mother's born-again experience transformed her life. She retreated from the social scene that had been a major part of her life as she studied the scriptures and learned about Jesus for herself. Her heart's desire was that her two sons would come to know the Lord. Her fervent prayers followed Pat to college in 1946 when he enrolled at Washington and Lee University in his hometown of Lexington. She was praying for me, and I couldn't get away uh, from her prayers. I was a party boy. I was in college. I was out drinking and, and running around. And, I, you know, I'm, she was very uh, indulgent, but I, you know, it was one of those things. You got a mother who prays. Well, good for her. But I, it was only later that I began to realize the depth of her faith and uh, how important it was. When President Truman reinstituted the draft in 1948, Pat enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. He was allowed to finish college at Washington and Lee while spending summers in Marine Corps officers training. In 1950, Pat graduated magna cum laude with a degree in history and earned membership into the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. After graduation, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. That summer, Soviet-backed North Korea invaded the South the United States rose in defense. The war postponed Pat's plan to enroll at Yale Law School. He served as assistant adjutant with the 1st Marine Division at a forward command post just north of the 38th parallel. He was awarded three battle stars for his service in the Korean War. With the end of the war, Pat headed off to law school at Yale. While there, he met a young woman named Dee Dee Elmer, 
who was earning her master's degree in nursing. Pat's late wife, Dee Dee, recalled their first rather eventful meeting. Well, that's kind of an exciting tale. He came to an open house that the student nurses had, and uh, I was trying to escape from someone else, and I said I had to work at the refreshment table, and I went down there, there was nothing I could do, so I tried to look busy, and my hair caught on fire, and Pat jumped up and put it out with his bare hands. Pat and Dee Dee fell in love. They married at the end of Pat's second year in law school. And somehow the fire that he put out in my hair moved to my heart, and it's never left. 1956, New York City, the business capital of the world. Pat, Dee Dee, and their infant son, Tim, lived on Staten Island, one of the city's five boroughs. An entrepreneur at heart, Pat co-founded and co-owned a company with classmates from Yale. It was a presidential election year, too. Pat chaired Staten Island's Democratic Committee to elect Adlai Stevenson for president. I don't like Texas. I doubt if anybody does. The Democrats lost that year. And though Pat's business venture prospered, he began to feel an emptiness in his life. That's when the futility began to come upon you, is that, you know, all these parties and all the stuff that you're doing and what's life all about. And so it, 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 that's when you, I had a, a real uh, crisis of, of asking, you know, who am I and what am I doing here? And so he just did some reflecting about his life, about his heavy drinking and partying. And as he did, he began to read his Bible. And uh, as a result of that, decided that he wanted to be a minister. The, the senator was okay with that. When he went home and talked to his mother, and his mother told him that he needed to get converted first <laughs> and that he needed to find Christ instead of just find a job. Pat's mother put him in touch with Cornelius Vanderbregen, a missionary and a former Marine Corps lieutenant. He led Pat to Christ over dinner in a Philadelphia restaurant. Pat's life was transformed. He felt compelled to serve the Lord and soon gave up his share in the startup venture to enroll in New York Seminary. Dee Dee recalled that time. Well, I knew he'd had a real experience. And it was hard for me because I was trying to claim I was a Christian. I'd always been in church, and I just felt I was a Christian. Pat's faith grew while in seminary. He developed a strong prayer life, studied scripture, and practiced the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All the while, Dee Dee struggled inside. Well, Pat just knew he was going to go to heaven, and he knew Jesus, and he could talk to him. And I just hoped I'd get there. To this day, I marvel at Pat because he put up with me when I was smoking and when I was trying to convince him that I was just as good as Christian as he was. And, you know, he put up with me and he never nagged me about it. And uh, I got saved at Word of Life camp in Upper New York. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. After Pat graduated from seminary, he moved Dee Dee and their growing family to New York's Bedford-Stuyvesant and began an inner city mission. Along the way, the Lord uh, showed me that I should take the airways from the prince of the power of the air and give them to the prince of peace. And I, I didn't know for sure what it was all about, but uh, there was this TV station down here that I'd heard about, and the Lord said, you know, go down and, and do it. So take your family from Brooklyn and go out to the place that I'm calling you. In 1960, with little more than a clear vision from God and a burning desire to tell others about Christ, Pat bought a defunct, UHF television station in Portsmouth, Virginia. 
Unbelievably, the founder and president of the Christian Broadcasting Network didn't even own a TV set. CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. The engineer who we had working for us did not believe that we could do it. So he didn't have the transmitter ready. Uh, you know, you can't necessarily leave your destiny in the hands of engineers, but anyway, um, but he finally, you know, hooked it up with bailing wire and got it going by maybe three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And we put our first broadcast on the air. We, we could hardly get around the block. I mean, it was a big deal. We didn't have a monitor. So I would run down the street where they had a, a TV with a snowy image and I'd turn it on to say, let me see channel 27. And they'd flip it on and they'd say, oh, we're on the air. So I'd run back to the studio. WYAH-TV was the first station to be granted an FCC license for broadcasting more than 50% religious programming. Pat directed, produced, and hosted shows in those early years. I don't know if I was tenacious or didn't have any better sense or, or I trusted God, but I, I felt this is what he wanted me to do. Behind the scenes, prayer and family were the pillars of Pat's groundbreaking ministry. That's one of my most vivid memories of my father, is every morning sitting in his wingback chair with his Bible open, sometimes on his knees, with his head bowed in prayer. You know, I do remember Dad always engaging with us. He might have had the longest day, might have had so many cares on his shoulders, but when he came home, he would run outside, play hide and seek with us. I loved my children and I, uh... I think I was approachable and played with them and prayed with them. But, but you know, I, I, I took seriously the 54th chapter of Isaiah, which said, your children shall be taught of the Lord. And uh, I, I really gave them over to the Lord and wasn't a very stern father. I've tried to set before them an example of what they should do and how they should live. And then I loved them. Off camera, Dee Dee created a loving home for the Robertson family. And that's what dad has needed beside him all these years, is a steadfast partner. Mom was dad's prayer partner. Uh, they would uh, pray over things together and come into agreement in prayer over things. My wife was a, was a good mother and she was out with the kids. Well, we had picnics and we did travel. Uh, uh, we took them all over the place with the back seat of the car and us traveling around, but uh, it was fun. Quite suddenly during the 1970s, a spiritual renewal burst into mainstream culture. It was a movement that had been gaining momentum for 20 years. The rise of the charismatic renewal was a, uh, a stunning explosion in the whole body of Christ. The revival gave occasion to a number of innovative things notably as it affected Pat, Christian television. And he was, of course, one of the foremost shapers of that. Uh, in fact, I think he made the most effective use of it, to my view. They hated uh, God and Jesus. They did? Yes, and the Bible was a forbidden book. How did you get that copy or the copy into the, into the concentration camp? That, that was, that was an, uh, a miracle. CBN captured the spiritual energy of the charismatic movement through its flagship program, The 700 Club, which Pat hosted. The program aired daily in homes across CBN's expanding network. Thank you. Oh, we've got a wonderful audience and a wonderful program. Longtime co-host, the late Ben Kenchlow, remembered Pat's humility amid the powerful platform the show created. Children, you know, children there was crazy. never any sense here at the 700 Club of Pat acting or letting us act or any of us feeling like we were, quote, somebody special. We had the matchless privilege of being a part of what God was doing. And I could stand by Pat Robertson's side and hold up his hand and, and pray with him and, you know, cry with him and laugh with him and see God do incredible things for people. Under Pat's leadership, CBN produced a wide range of Christian programming, like Harold Bradison's Charisma, a show that helped reestablish Christianity in popular culture. 
Interviews with international leaders like Egypt's Anwar Sadat and Israel's Menachem Begin, and then governor and presidential candidate Jimmy Carter, paved the way for news programming with a Christian perspective. CBN was among the very first broadcasters to use satellite distribution technology. In the spring of 1977, CBN beamed a live TV signal via satellite around the globe from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Suddenly, the vision of reaching the world with the gospel was a real possibility. Along with religious programs, CBN Cable aired family-friendly entertainment. The network later became the Family Channel. By the time CBN's Family Channel was sold in 1997, it was viewed by nearly 50 million households. In the fall of 1979, CBN dedicated a new studio headquarters building in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Billy Graham was the keynote speaker. Jesus Christ said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. For the first time in the history of the church, it's now possible to preach the gospel to all the world. May God bless Pat Robertson, his wife, his staff, and the ministry of CBN. And the 700 you. Club has always included an interactive component, offering viewers an opportunity to call in to receive salvation or prayer for help. Bringing people into relationship with Jesus Christ was always Pat's main focus. If you are a viewer, you remember Pat as being the guy who sat there on the camera and told you how you could meet Jesus Christ personally and, and join us in prayer. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you can know him today as your personal savior. Thank you. Pat's Jesus. life passion was to tell people about Christ and lead them in the sinner's prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that you save my soul. And I'll live for you and I'll serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I think that he walked the baby boomers home, sharing faith, sharing concepts, providing principles, and not only his own, but he created a platform for others to stand on and their views to be heard, even if their views were different from his. He was broad enough uh, in his capacity to engage others who thought differently and sometimes learn from them and sometimes challenge them. He was a happy. And I was one of those that he invited me to talk about Samaritan's Purse and uh, asked me questions about what we were doing. I was just so grateful that he cared for me as a young preacher uh, to encourage me and to encourage the ministry that, that uh, God had given me at Samaritan's Purse. He just did that for hundreds of organizations. Uh, he, he wasn't selfish. Uh, he, he wanted to lift up the Lord's work, and he did that in a, in a wonderful way. Come on, America, discover the book. 1983 was the year more of us read the good book. Can we make a resolution here today that 1984 will be the year we put its great truths into action? As the 700 Club evolved as a platform for Christian truth, more emphasis was placed on reporting world events, news, and analysis. CBN News was birthed out of the programming change to provide news from the Christian perspective was something that had never been done, still never done the way that he did it. Uh, his engagement beyond the CBN world into the NRB showed a willingness to share uh, his concepts beyond his dominion. International Bible teacher and fellow broadcaster Kay Arthur served with Pat on the board of the National Religious Broadcasters. But you know what I loved about him? I never saw him withdraw. I saw him apologize if he thought he was wrong, but I never saw him withdraw or go off of the battlefield. And I admired that. Pat was always an anchor point of maintaining the word, the spirit, and manifest in real character. As we know, there's been the ups and downs in Christian television, but Pat has stayed uh, focused. He's he stayed focused on the gospel. 
and using this ministry to promote uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1989, CBN embarked on the boldest initiative in the history of Christian TV. The wall fell in Berlin and the East opened. Perestroika emerged in the Soviet Union. There was now a whole new audience for the gospel message. Pat never missed a beat as he began to develop programming for countries behind the collapsing Iron Curtain. After CBN's success in the former Soviet Union, Pat began to draw up plans for an even greater push into regions formerly closed to the gospel message. Throughout the 1990s, CBN International took on more and more challenges. During this time, Pat's close friend Bill Bright was a great source of encouragement. Their friendship had been forged back in 1980 after Pastor John Jimenez united evangelical and charismatic leaders during Washington for Jesus. Prior to that prayer event on the National Mall in D.C., evangelical and charismatic Christians didn't work closely together. Pat's friendship with the late Bill Bright changed that. That we're here to pray. We're here to confess our sins. As the new millennium dawned, both leaders were focused on getting the gospel to unreached people groups. The CBN facility that reaches out to millions every day, there's no one else who could say with credibility and authenticity, we're going to reach a half a billion. You and your great team, Pat, have won the respect and admiration of the multitudes of believers. CBN International began to create programming with indigenous hosts. Its success was a great source of joy and, at times, frustration. Well, frankly, it's hard because a lot of people just think we're one television program. And when they begin to see everything that we're doing, you know, 90% of the work we do is overseas. Pat's legacy hosting a live television show is virtually unmatched with over six decades on the air. A balanced budget. Good to see you, Pat. Great pleasure. Pessimist, I'm an optimist. And if you're on TV every day, every day, through every week of your life, you're going to say something from time to time. They did the crash and they leap on the things with cameras. But that is the risk that we all take for being out front. And being a trailblazer, you're going to be shot at. Pat Robertson was a trailblazer, and trailblazers take blows. He was strong enough to take a blow and stand back up again and open up the show the next day. And that is a rare breed of an individual. Uh, you're going to be in... Pat hosted the same daily show for more years than any other figure in history all the while raising the funds to preach the gospel. Those who worked alongside him, like former co-host Sheila Walsh, respected Pat's authentic life. Let's pray right now ask God to bless us. Father, in Jesus' name. One of the things that I never had a shadow of a doubt about Pat was that he was doing what he was doing for an audience of one. And I think there were many moments when it was very difficult. There's times when what you are sharing and what you feel very convicted about is not popular, and there can be a lot of criticism. And I think if you were simply doing it to build a platform for yourself or to leave a platform for your family, it would be very easy to get discouraged and want to move on. But if you know as deep as the marrow in your bones that the God of heaven and earth has called you for this time and for this season, then you show up every day faithfully and do what he has called you to do. And that's something that I never lost for a second. It's my tremendous respect for Pat, for the years he spent studying for his knowledge of the Word of God, for the amount of time that I knew he spent on his knees praying before he ever hit the studio. Pat had a calling and a gifting and anointing for that time, and I've never seen anyone else have that. What is Pat Robertson's mark? He is a founder, and there's not many people that are called to start so many enterprises for the kingdom. Jay Sekulow, chief counsel for the American Center for Law and Justice, believes Pat Robertson's legacy is best reflected in the organizations he birthed and nurtured. I look at the people that founded our country. Uh, Pat had a similar vision at a different time. Look at the entities that he formed, uh, that God used him to create, whether it's 
the Christian Broadcasting Network, the ACLJ, Regent University, Operation Blessing. Uh, I mean, so many institutions, the Christian Coalition. Pat always had a sense of the world in mind. He had a sense that Christianity just didn't belong in the confines of the church, but that it was to permeate all of life. And I think that's why uh, God even led him to uh, start Regent University. I bowed my head to say thanks. And as I did, God began speaking to me very clearly. He said, I want you to buy all the land and build your headquarters. And then he said, build a school for my glory. That's all. Dr. David Geyerson was a founding administrator and former president of Regent University. He believes prophetic vision was one of Pat's greatest strengths. Well, I think one of the things that, that Regent possesses is this wonderful inheritance that is part of uh, you know, Pat's legacy of thinking creatively outside of the box, moving into the future, always asking the Lord, what are you doing next and how can we be a part of it? That has been the legacy of Pat Roberts' ministry. Regent University opened its doors in 1978 as CBN University. Just 70 communication arts students were enrolled. In 1990, the name was changed to Regent. Today, there are more than 31,000 alumni. The current student population of approximately 11,000 from 82 countries study in 54 degree programs. Now, I want to congratulate you graduates. You are wonderful. Give yourselves a hand. Business Week magazine named the American Center for Law and Justice the leading advocacy group for religious freedom. Pat saw a need, uh, which is you know, part of Pat's life has been that, uh, is, is seeing a need. And that was there was not sophisticated advocacy uh, for Christians uh, against groups like the ACLU and People for the American Way. So basically what happened was individuals that had, let's say, pro-life convictions were being bulldozed over by the courts. And there was no organized opposition uh, until the American Center for Law and Justice came on the scene and Pat saw that need and filled it. And Pat was always concerned about finding uh, the best way to help those in need and making the biggest impact, the biggest precedent we possibly could. Radical. Pat was always a voice of encouragement. I mean, when, I, when people say, who's the, the greatest cheerleader for the ACLJ? It's been Pat Robertson, and there's no doubt about that. I mean, we had controversial cases. We'd be getting clobbered in the press. Pat was flawless. I'll never forget, we had a meeting with a lot of our senior lawyers, and everybody was worried about this particular case, and Pat just calm the waters. Uh, so that's the part you miss the most. In the summer of 1994, 35 years after Pat had graduated from New York Seminary, he returned to Manhattan with Operation Blessing and kicked off a coast-to-coast -coast thrust to feed America's hungry. We need your praying because we need people to help in this effort all over the nation. And among other things, we need churches because what I want people to do, I want the church to be the leader in the community. The compassion was real. This was not simply a, a tricking people into being interested in hearing the gospel by giving them things. It was a care and a love for people. And of course, that's a masterful uh, testimony to the way Jesus is, the heart of God is. Pat started Operation Blessing in 1978 after reading the scriptures in Isaiah about caring for the poor. Those early outreaches included meals for the hungry, blankets for the homeless, and groceries to feed families in crisis. By 1983, Operation Blessing was a nationally recognized charity. That's what's happening with CBN and the 700 Club's Operation Blessing. They've given nearly two and a half million dollars to more than 8,500 churches. And this money is then matched by the local churches. And the result has been fantastic. We worked on God's faithfulness. So it wasn't like we had this huge store of resources that we drew from. It was like God led us step by step. The need for staple foods like brown rice led to distribution projects in suffering and remote areas. We are terribly impressed by this project of yours. Thank you. And I, I think that 
A lot of people assume, you know, that there are no more hundred people in this country, and that's just not so. Terry Mewson, co-host of The 700 Club, first shared in Operation Blessings Hunger Relief Convoys three decades ago. And I mean, to this day, tons of food every month go out across this country to hungry families. When there's disaster, relief needed. I mean, OB is first on the spot and last to leave. And he is the one who was the catalyst for all of that, the one saying, get the job done. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Oh, bless your heart. You know, it's my privilege and joy. I've been on medical missions trips and seen cleft palates repaired and hearts repaired. And, you know, we've done all kinds of eye surgeries for people who'd lost their vision. So that was quite amazing. And that's been fairly low profile in his ministry in many people's minds, but it, globally it has been powerfully impacting. Would you like me to pray for you? Operation Blessing has made an impact in the lives of millions of people in more than 90 countries and territories, providing hunger relief, clean water, medical care, and disaster relief. He had a tremendous, compassionate heart for people in need. You know, he's... <laughs> Pat was such a, a voice in our culture for righteousness and a voice in politics for righteousness too, really, that often I think people heard that and maybe wouldn't have known about the tenderness of his heart. But he was a man who really saw need and was touched by it and moved to do something to make a difference. Pat also embraced the idea of Orphan's Promise that was birthed from Terry's own adoptive experience with her three daughters. CBN has given, and Pat has given, such a nod to everything that we have been able to do. What do you like so about? God has allowed us to just become another arm extended from CBN to expand the work that's being done, not just for orphans, but for vulnerable kids, kids who are affected by poverty or drug usage in their family, and for parents who are too poverty stricken to take care of their children and would have put them in an orphanage. You know that scripture Pat always quoted, may your people be willing in the day of your power. And yes, I mean, may the answer for, from all of us be, God, here we are, send us, use us, we're here. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, paid the Christian broadcaster a great honor. Pat Robertson has been a magnificent friend of Israel, and he's been a personal friend of mine. Uh, I felt that we had no greater friend in the world, and I mean that. We have no greater friend in the world than Pat Robertson. Pat was a friend to Israel because he believed it was biblical. After a 1974 interview with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, Pat vowed that he and CBN would always support Israel. Four decades of interviewing Israeli leaders forged bonds of friendship that Orthodox Jewish Rabbi Daniel Lapin believes changed history. It will forever uh, be uh, marked on the radar screen of history. Um, I, I think he, he will always uh, be there as, as a towering leader who was one of the earliest to, to literally transform 2,000 years of Christian Jewish relationships into something warm and close and compassionate and friendly and loving in, in a way that literally uh, changed history. Pat inspired me greatly to form the American Alliance of Jews and Christians, and I, I realized that there were enormous gulfs that needed to be bridged. From his platform on the 700 Club, Pat informed TV audiences about the challenges facing the Jewish state. We're here at Yad Vashem, which is a place of great mourning and a great significance. Uh, I, I guess the posture of Israel is never again. No doubt. No doubt. I think the, the most significant lesson uh, that can be learned from Pat Robertson's life is how a critical phrase from the Bible springs to life. Pat Robertson made the phrase, be strong and of good courage, literally leap off the pages of Deuteronomy and off the pages of Joshua. In ancient Jewish wisdom, the phrase, be strong and of good courage, encapsulates, number one, 
knowing what to do, and number two, having the courage to do it. Pat's greatest endorsement in life came from the love and respect he earned from his wife, Dee Dee, his four children, and his grandchildren who have followed him in faith and in service. I've tried to set before them an example of what they should do and how they should live. And, and I loved them. We had a lot of close, huggy, kissy sort of family. You know, they were wonderful children. My lingering memory of my father is every single morning I'd wake up and go to school, he will have been already up and on his knees and praying, and, and praying for direction, praying for wisdom. It was always his heart cry for that. And then one of his signature prayers, God, I want to be part of your plan. Not my plan, not what I want to do. Can I be part of your plan? Uh, was his prayer. Without a doubt, the greatest gift my dad gave all of us children was this understanding that if you really want to know what to do with your life and where to go, no matter what the circumstance was, go to God and let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. You know, I think the one thing that stands out about Dad to me is how he, is, he has taken God at His word, His faith. His faith is incredible. He believes that God will do what He says He will do, and He's never doubted it. And that's been an inspiration to me all my life. And He trusts that God is going to do what He said He's going to do. And I think He's willing to take risks because of that. They raised me in a godly home and they gave us parameters and but then we, you know, kind of found our own path and they let us explore that path. And I think they've encouraged all the things that as children that we've wanted to do and, and um, discouraged other things we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Everyone sees my grandfather on TV every day looking so dapper in his tie and coat, but I am one of the lucky people who gets to see him in one of his famous velour track suits, which he loves so much. I think my grandfather's biggest accomplishment is the family Christian legacy that he has given to all of us. And I mean, every single one of us, I mean, the children are so different, the grandchildren are so different, but the one thing we all have in common is that we all have a real relationship with Jesus. I grew up at the office and I'd see him in the studio oftentimes and I thought that that was very normal. I would um, play hopscotch over camera wires. Every single morning he reads the Bible, whether it's on vacation or at the house, I'd have to say that that's my strongest memory of him. He was always encouraging me to, to keep pursuing knowledge and education, and so I think that's a big part of shaping um, who I am, why I chose to go to law school, why I, I love academia, I love reading, and I think he really shaped me in that area, so. I think growing up, people would always say, you know, what's it like having Pat Robertson as your grandfather? And I would always just say, you know, he's just granddaddy. I mean, to us, he's granddaddy. I just assumed growing up that everyone's grandfather was running for president and doing all that fun stuff. Being able to see the world through his eyes, I think that's one thing that he's really given us is a heart for God's people and all the people of the world and just exposing us to things that we never would have known otherwise. I think Granddaddy's faith has inspired me to pray boldly and pray big um, and just the times that he's prayed for us in our lives I mean he just he's a man of such faith and he lives it and he believes that God hears us and he answers our prayers and he's lived that and I think he's really encouraged me to see that too he always encouraged me just to be who I was and not to be ashamed of it he always encourages us to like get in the word and to study and to really just um, channel what God really wants for our lives. He always is concerned about my health and sports and he tries to keep me healthy and injury free 
and he always has advice to keep my elbow strong because I've gone through many injuries and he's prescribed me many vitamins to keep my joints healthy and help me to stay young. He was all, he always kind of had that presence uh, in my mind uh, as a kid of you know being a strong and healthy person. I was always intrigued by that and um, he was to me was a source of knowledge in learning about that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time Charlie and I were in the back of the car and he would not slow down and I get very car sick. And Charlie looked over and I had thrown up in a Ziploc bag rather than ask him to pull over. <laughs> <laughs> I know that he prays for his family and he prays for um, the generations that are beyond him. And so I think a lot of it can just be the Lord's faithfulness. So yeah. nothing that he did, it's, it's God. Um, I think a lot of it too is just his focus on his children throughout his life too, which you know have enabled us to have great parents who love the Lord and uh, you know wanted us us to walk with the Lord in our lives. And of course, as you probably have heard from the other grandchildren, um, over Christmas the tradition is we'll do the Christmas story and he'll um, quiz us about all the facts and that's been very exciting and of course competitive. When I was, I don't know, uh, 11 or 12 years old, I read a book that Granddaddy wrote, um, Shadow from the Housetops. I remember thinking like, I didn't know any of this happened. The evidence there for God um, in Granddaddy's life story and in my parents' life story, and um, I mean, that's, that's a backbone of my faith. What happens on the golf course with my, with the granddaddy stays there. You talk about the weather, talk about how fun we had, how much fun we had together. Um, but in terms of who shot what and who didn't shoot it, it just kind of stays between between the guys. For me, when I come back to CBN campus and and see the legacy that he has and what he what. The, the Lord has done through him and, and so much of it just from my grandfather just surrendering and saying, okay, what's next? I think for me, just to understand just that the importance of letting go. I got baptized in the ocean right out in Virginia Beach and so granddaddy went in with my um, pastor at the time and, uh, and it was a really special, special moment to sort of Go into your old self and come back out as your new self, especially with your grandfather right there by your side. The idea that he had the foresight to call it the Christian Broadcasting Network, when it's my grandmother rolling the camera and him speaking to almost no one, just, it still blows my mind. And so I said, you know, granddaddy, that doesn't seem like a very logical path for someone from, you know, Yale Law School to take. And I said, what made you take it? And he said, when the Lord tells you to go, you have to go. <laughs> There's going to be young guys, young women out there that, that are going to watch this and who will say, Lord, if it be thy will, use me the way you use Pat. If it be thy will, use me like you use Billy Graham. And uh, that's how, what I hope we can be to another generation. We can be a role model. And Pat certainly was a role model and a, an inspiration to uh, not only uh, my generation, but to younger generations, uh, those that are coming behind me. I'd like to say to the Robertson family that only God can pay you for the sacrifices you've made and now the losses that you share. But that God is so able to do so. They too were great servants to share such a patriarch with so many of the world who needed a father and a national thought leader so desperately. And I just thank God for his life and for his ministry uh, and for this wonderful network that uh, is continuing and will continue for years and years and years to come, uh, touching another generation with the power of the gospel. Pat Robertson was one of the most influential 20th century Christian figures in the evolution of Christian thought and in the expansion of Christianity throughout the world. He and his organization that he built have had a powerful worldwide influence on the history of Christianity in the 20th and 21st century. That's a pretty good legacy. Pat summed up his many accomplishments by boasting about the goodness of God. His message to the end 
was full of assurance and comfort for anyone that would follow in his footsteps, serving mankind in the name of Jesus Christ. The thing that stands out above all else is that God is faithful. He absolutely is faithful. He absolutely does what he says he can do. We can absolutely trust him. God is alive. He is present. If one thing I could tell people, you can trust the Lord. I think that more than anything else is that God is faithful. He does what he says he'll do. And may you carry that legacy, that God is faithful. If you saw that and you're wondering how in the world could that happen to me, well, let me encourage you. It happened for my father with just three dollars. Way back in 1960, God gave him a vision for Christian television. So he said, well, I'm going to need a vessel for this vision. And he went to the State Corporation Commission of Virginia, and he applied for a nonprofit corporation called the Christian Broadcasting Network Incorporated. At that point in time, he didn't even own a television set, let alone a Christian station, let alone a network, but he had a big vision. And then with that vision, he said, well, we're going to need a bank account, aren't we? Yeah. So he went down to the local bank and he said, well, I've got my certificate from the State Corporation Commission. I want to open a bank account. And they said, well, we would be glad to help you with that. And so they filled out all the paperwork. And then the bank manager looked very sweetly at him and asked him, well, it's customary to open the account with an initial deposit. Well, Dad <laughs> didn't think that far ahead. And so all he had was $3 on him. And he said, well, I've, I've got $3. Is, is that enough? Well, well, the checks cost $6 was the response. And so he said, well, can I have that on credit? <laughs> And the bank manager said, okay. And that was the beginning of the Christian Broadcasting Network. But the wisdom to choose, it's better to own a Christian station than it is to own a, a, a television set. We didn't have a television set until 1963. And so we started in 1961. And the first time the family could actually see what daddy was doing was 1963. Choose wisely and choose that prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. Lord, make me part of your plan, not my plan. I want to be a part of your plan. Now, for grandparents out there, for parents out there, here's a way you can claim a legacy for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. It's a verse that God gave me last week. He pointed it out, underlined it in Isaiah 59. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Claim that covenant. It's for you, your children, and your grandchildren. Terry? Well, it's no secret that Regent University was the apple of Pat's eye. As founder, chancellor, and CEO, Pat took Regent from humble beginnings to a premier university with more than 11,000 students and 150 areas of study. Let's go back to the year 1978 and watch as Pat first announces his vision for a new university. The day that we have all longed for has at last come, and we see the hand of God in every one of you that have come to be students at a new university. We're here that we might lead and explore together with keen, eager students, and together we're going to learn. It's not just going to be academics, it's going to be spiritual. But it's not just going to be spiritual, it's going to be academics. And, it's, and it, it's going to be a blending, we hope, of the highest spirituality and the richest scholarship. It's going to be necessary to have what one of the New England divines called beaten oil. The oil is not enough, it needs to be beaten oil. And there, there's going to be the anointing and there's going to be the flow of the Holy Spirit. But along with that, there's going to be some labor. There's going to be some understanding. We're going to pray.
push our intellectual capacities across an invisible line and as we break through those lines there's pain and not too many people are willing to pay the price to go across that line but the champions do it If we're going to be dealing with the things that do not perish, we are dealing with eternity. And therefore, we're going to give more than they'll give. Whatever the secular scholars give, whatever the secular athletes give, whatever is necessary to do better, we want to do better. We feel that right now communications is the most important thing that is happening because uh, this is, is the cutting edge of evangelism and of the relationship of people. But we're concerned at CBN University with government. We're concerned about the educational processes. We feel that business is of terrific importance in our world today and such other things as the Lord would give us. We don't want to be copiers, we want to be innovators because we're serving the one who is the source of all wisdom and all knowledge, and that's the Lord God himself. Christian leadership to change the world, the mantra of Regent University, and really could be said of all of us who watched your dad live so well and want to tag on. <laughs> well, one of the things in that, that we pointed out in that video as we were talking as it was running is the cinder blocks behind him. Yeah. Uh, that was a very important day. It was an unfinished building, but it was an important day because it was the first time what was then uh, CBN University, it's now Regent University, moved out of trailers. It started in double wide trailers in Chesapeake. Don't despise the days of small beginnings That's true. Uh, because the Lord rejoices that the work has begun. When you have that attitude that even if you just have $3, how can God multiply that? Yeah. You saw how he's mu multiplied it. He will do that for you. Now we close today's program with a wonderful word from Matthew that I spoke over my father last night. Mm. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.